Hello, everyone. Welcome to the continuing RKG series on SEO webinars. Uh, today, we, we will pre be presenting link building for the long haul. Uh, you can be sure to follow the conversation today on Twitter. Uh, our handle is at Rim Kaufman, uh, hashtag link building. I'm Ryan Gibson. I'll be the MC for today's event. Uh, I head up the marketing team here at RKG. Um, and with me today, we have Adam Audette, our chief knowledge officer. Great to be here. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. For those of you who don't know about RKG, RKG is a data-driven online marketing firm. Uh, we offer full-service uh, paid search, uh, social media display, managed comparison shopping engines. Um, we tie all those uh, pieces together with our own proprietary attribution platform. But today we're going to focus on SEO. And specifically, we're going to talk about link building. Um, we have, we're going to address five principles of of link building. Um, first, we'll talk about being making sure you're staying focused on rel the relevance, content, and the audience, making sure that your link building efforts are sustainable and scalable, making sure that you're focusing on what matters and uh, not focused on the metrics, but using the metrics as a tool to guide you. And at the end, we'll talk about how you can make sure that you're staying focused on creating value. Throughout today's sessions, uh, please be sure and address questions uh, through the question panel on GoToMeeting, and we'll be sure to address those uh, as we go through. And from here, we'll hand this over to Adam Audette to get us started on uh, content relevance and the audience. Cool. Thanks, Ryan. And hello, everyone. Glad to be here again. I guess this is our third SEO webinar that we've done uh, recently, and we'll have a lot more webinars coming up. But um, link building is super, obviously incredibly popular topic in SEO and, and is, I would say, an essential part of SEO. It's one of the, the largest scoring factors out there. Um, that may change in time, but right now, you know, if you're doing SEO, you need to be focused on link building. So we really built this presentation around these five principles, and so we're going to talk to each one. Uh, the focus here is much more on strategy and concepts and less on tactics. Although there will be, a, you know, a few, a few tactical things to glean from this, um, and then after we go through these five principles, we also have a section where we're going to, going to be talking about um, analyzing a link profile, and then what to do and how to how to go about kind of cleaning up your links if you have problems in the profile. So let's focus first on number one: uh, relevance and audience. So the way that the kind of classic SEO approach to link building is, hey. Uh, let's do some keyword research. Let's figure out, you know, what content to write, and let's build the content and build the links. But I think we need to, as SEOs, we all need to up our game a little bit. And instead of focusing on keyword research, we need to think about much more the people that are actually using the keywords. So you need to think about, as a company, you know, who is your target demographic? What are their goals? What are their motivators? What are they trying to accomplish? And what is your value proposition or your value propositions in delivering that to them so that they can accomplish their tasks and what they're setting out to do? And then how does that line up with your conversion goals as a company and what your success metrics are? So it's just instead of thinking about just keyword research, you're actually thinking about the demographic that is using keywords to find stuff that you have. So this means we need to do some stuff that's a little bit out of the, the norm for typical SEO, but this is all incredibly valuable stuff. Persona development and, and doing some brainstorming to understand what those personas are and what they're looking for. Categorization exercises, which basically means brainstorming and figuring out you know, what categories of tasks people are trying to accomplish and how you fit into those tasks and where you want to fit in depending on what your goals are as a company. And finally, their query behavior, and that's the keyword research part. But as you can see, the query behavior is really further down the line from what you're, it, it's, it's one piece of what you're trying to understand. You're trying to understand an entire audience or you know, a, a particular audience, I should say, and that audience uses keywords to find stuff. But you know, the query, it doesn't start with the keywords. It starts with personas and where you fit into that. Personas are important because they, they allow you to focus your mind on what tasks your potential audience is trying to accomplish. And when you put together those, those personas, you figure out that your audience might be comprised of five different types or three different types or two or even one. And it really 
it forces you to refine your focus and strategies to dial right in on what her needs are. And same for category and task exercises, you know, using sticky notes or using a whiteboard and brainstorming and figuring out, you know, it's not keywords we're going after, it's people. And those people are trying to accomplish stuff online and we can provide that to them. So let's figure out what categories we need to focus on to do that, the categories that line up with our, our you know, our business goals. In the end, you're going to end up with something like this instead of, and, and this looks very much like so-called, you know, typical keyword research, but behind it is a lot of thought into the topics or categories, and in those categories are a whole bunch of queries, and those queries are dynamic, not static, so those change over time and based on search volume and, and behavior and trends and all that stuff. I'm a big fan of quick and dirty keyword research, and this is free, Google Insights, as SEOs, I'm sure that most of the people on this webinar have used this or are using this. It's a really quick and easy way to accurately figure out search volumes and prioritize you know, your keywords accordingly. You shouldn't just prioritize um, keywords based on search volume, but it's an important indicator of, of where you want to focus, because obviously we want to go after people that are, that are using the keywords. Also on um, Google Insights, it gives you a, a lot of information on related terms, you can narrow it down by region, either country or city, and this is really useful for content strategy. So at the end of all this stuff, here's what you end up with. You end up with a, a model for a set of personas and their motivators, and what tasks they're trying to accomplish, and then you end up with what queries they're using, what keywords they're using, and that's the keyword research part. And then you answer, here's what we want to provide them or what we can provide them, and if you don't have all of that content now, you know what content you need to build. You also answer what you want them to do. Do you want them to convert and sign up? Do you want them to add, you know, add you? Do you want their email in your newsletter? Do you want to call them, et cetera, et cetera? And you understand why they'll do it because you're, you're creating a value proposition on your end to satisfy whatever their task is. And that gives you a success metric. A success might be a conversion if you're an e-commerce store. Or it might be a lead. So we can pause there for a second if there are any questions, or we can just keep going right on through. Okay, let's talk about sustainability. Um, sustainability in the, in the context of link building means not putting your neck out too far and not exposing yourself to too much risk, because there's a lot of risk in link building, let's be honest. Um, I'm going to go through a quick little history of Panda and Penguin and so forth. If we go way back, um, the content mills, everybody remember the content mills? fast, disposable, and profitable as hell content. It was also terrible from a user experience, but it worked well for SEO. Well, then Google Panda came out. Google said, hey, that's not a very good user experience. It's not really good for our business model. Um, our search results have to stay pretty, pretty useful. So Panda torched a lot of the thin content, uh, excuse me, thin content sites. Demand Media was kind of the poster child of thin content and the content mills, and they were down 40% uh, after Panda. But it wasn't just the content side, it was also the link graph. The link graph was and continues to be rotten. It's been abused, it's been used, it's been spammed up, stuff like this. This is just a profile site on a, on a programmer's uh, forum, and you know, somebody is, is using exact match anchor text in uh, the profile there, in the bio, diet ephedrine and woman plus size skirts. This has no relevance for anyone. It's completely only for search engines. It's spammy. You end up with stuff like this. This is an, an example of a most perfect anchor text profile. It, it has every money term and different variations of those money terms. This is not a natural way to link. This is not how people link on the web. Search engines know that. This no longer works like it used to. The funny thing about paid links is they leave a big footprint. They're kind of like steroids. You can just kind of tell when somebody's been spamming it up too hard. So it hasn't been too difficult for Google to put an end to this stuff and start to close the holes. Just like Panda focused on closing uh, thin content, Penguin focuses on carving out bad manipula manipulative spammy links. And if you think about sustainability in this case, you know companies like JCPenney and other very large enterprise companies have been burned by this. Just recently, it was Interflora in the UK. It happens all the time. There are, there are entire agencies that are banned and delisted. 
uh, Panda and Penguin are sort of this one-two punch on low-quality uh, spammy SEO. That has worked in the past, but that window is getting smaller and smaller literally every week. So what is sustainable link building? Well, it's really focusing on one thing, your users, and not thinking about search engines and, and how it affects search engines. Obviously, as part of an SEO campaign, link building is about search engines. But if it's about users first, it puts you in the right position because the search engines, and especially Google here, are following users. Search engines want to do what's best for users. So if you focus on the users, you're actually focusing on the right thing. It also, sustainability also means building real value and thinking about building value and building experiences, not building links. Instead of thinking about how do we build a thousand links, we should be thinking about how do we build something really cool and valuable that our audience will love. So as ironic as it sounds, and on this link building uh, webinar, you should really forget about link building. You should think about content building and experience building and think about adding value and contributing. And it's not easy to do and there are no real shortcuts, but this is the way that you actually succeed the most at link building because great con content attracts really good links, which means you have to hire, if it's, if it's content you're going to write, it means hiring real writers. Using great photography and great design is very important. And just create an overall high quality experience. When, when a site, it, whether it's a blog or it's a resource site or whatever it is, when it's a good experience and it's easy to use and it's, it's aesthetically pleasing and all that stuff, um, people are going to come back. And that's the kind of stuff that's going to attract links. Great digital experiences are what attracts links. And you know this this little meme generator encapsulates it, encapsulates it very well. You want to deliver wow. You want to make people surprised and delighted. The reason that Zappos was so successful as a company early on was because they delivered incredible customer service, and that was a real differentiator. And people talked about it, and it got them literally millions of links over the years. But it was because they had a higher calling. They weren't trying to build millions of links. They were just trying to do something really cool, and that was deliver great customer service. So that's a really important principle to keep in mind. Number three is scalability. We've got, to, we've got to do stuff that's scalable. And really, what is that? What is scalable link building? One word, content. Content is the way that you really scale links and link building. There's always going to be an element of sort of manual link building, but I truly believe that manual link building needs to be a part of social outreach. It needs to be part of PR, public relations, and good overall marketing. We need to, as an industry, get away from the idea of you know, picking up the phone and calling people and emailing people for a single link because we want them to with the, the anchor text that we would like. We need to think about it as a cohesive brand strategy or company strategy to, to use social media and other channels to reach out to people to get links. That's scalable. The manual kind of outreach is not very scalable. So we partnered with CareerBuilder, uh, who joined us for actually our first webinar that we did. We, we partnered with them on, on a few different things. And one was to put together a scalable content and link development program for some of their sites. They actually have, you know, they have tons of um, job profiles, 90 million or more. Um, they have a million jobs a month. They obviously need stuff that's scalable. They're a big enterprise company. The cool thing about what CareerBuilder builder can do is they have a lot of data and they can at least partly automate content out of that data so if you'll see here this is a very scalable approach because the stuff in on the all the content that you see the data points is all content that they possess data that they possess that they can easily um, create content out of so they're not having to go and do a whole bunch of research on this they can create uh, basically create content automatically out of this data with that, it has been augmented on the right-hand side with articles. It says recent articles, and there are a bunch listed right there. And that's some stuff that, uh, that RKG helped to support, as well as others. Those articles link to the job profiles. And they do it in a way that's compelling, and it's good content, and it's very useful, and it's unique, and it's not published anywhere else. Um, so it's a combination of some manual you know article writing which you know if you want to do good content you can't get around having to actually do that but it's also automated in a way that is scalable um, the goal here is really just to increase traffic to the talent network the talent network is a group of sites owned by career builder on jobs.net and our approach was really to build this targeted high quality content and drive traffic that way so 
after doing this for several months and writing a lot of articles and as part of an overall strategy, uh, we were able to attract about 350 external links to the content, and it also created about 330 internal links that we were able to build from that content. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of links, but a key thing to understand here is that it's enough links, and it's not about quantity of links, it's about quality of links. And when you build highly relevant, high-quality links, you need one, not a thousand. What this did for them is it resulted in about a th over a 3,000% increase in organic traffic. Started from a very small base, we're talking about thousands of visits, but turned into hundreds of thousands of visits over a period of, of months. So obviously it works very, very well. It's something that you have to invest in, but um, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. It doesn't have to be that approach. There's many, many different approaches to building links. Another great one is what Online Shoes does with their promotions. So every year they do the 12 days of Christmas, and they build follow, following on uh, Facebook, and they promote and give away product, and they just make it a big kind of celebration around the holidays, which is obviously a big season for them. And it works very well to build a lot of links. At RKG, we're f firm believers in practicing what we preach. Uh, every quarter, we release the team releases a uh, digital marketing report, and it's all of our own data, all of our own analysis, and it, it's stuff that, that we really enjoy doing and part of our, our thought leadership, but what it does is it allows us to, to um, use it to market RKG because we get reached uh, by you know, trade publications and media for interviews, and it gets picked up by Search Engine Land and Media Post, and, uh, and we use it in, in lots of different ways. Should we take a pause and see if there's any questions? Yeah, I think there are a few questions, and I think you raise a really good point, is that you know, a lot of this gets back to it's just smart marketing. It's doing what's right for your customers, doing what's right for, 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 for your clients. And at the end of the day, if you're doing things really well, it's going to be shareable, it's going to be uh, and, and, and create links. Um, a couple of questions have come in. You know, one of the first ones is, uh, I think, is referring specifically to your career builder example. Can you talk a little bit about to the to the scale of the articles? Is this how how was that? How did you guys think about that? Sure. So uh, scale of our, so quantity of articles. Are they looking for okay? Um, less than one hundred articles uh, in that to get those results. And you know, to be totally clear. It, that was part of an overall SEO strategy, so it included other, other stuff too, and technical work and on-page work, uh, but the content was really the driver for the link building because we needed, career, career builder needed to build compelling content that would attract links. The job posting themselves, excuse me, the job postings themselves weren't quite enough, so um, it, it, even though, you know, it, it wasn't everything, it was a big piece of the strategy there. And how was that balance between? Um, how did they think about the balance between in-house work? You know what? Uh, you know when you're we're talking to, um, you know w websites that have to uh, have limited staffs, obviously um, uh, advertisers. Uh, how did how do you guys usually balance that, or how do how do you help people think about that? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think you know the ideal model is at least in the enterprise is an in-house team being supported by external pieces. So in RKG's case, we really focus on not necessarily con content implementation, although we can create the content. It's, ours is much going to be much more of the you know, high quality writing that's going to take a little bit longer to do. Um, it can be augmented by stuff like um, you know, scalable content by a Brafton or somebody like that. Um, it can be augmented by automated type content like taking the data that, that we showed up on, on the screen there before from CareerBuilder. Um, but it's definitely a combination of things, um, and that's the key is that you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be resource intensive. All it has to be is really useful, and even if you do, you know, I don't think it used to be the best practice back in the day was you should blog every day or every week or something like that. I actually think with all the noise online and just the, the business online, it's better to blog less and blog better than it is to blog more and blog worse. And I think that's the key with content, too. Is it's better to, to do less if you do it better than it is to do more just for the sake of more. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, I think one question that comes from your, the notion of uh, what CareerBuilder did with, with taking existing data and uh, curating it, if you will, uh, the question of you know, how do you think about that balance between what you need to create from scratch and, and what you can curate? And, and do you always have to be curating your 
own information and how then, then you end up with this slippery slope of duplicate content. And I don't want to get too deep into that discussion, but can you share some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, if you have, not every company is going to have data that they can leverage in that way. Um, but if you do have the data, that's great. That's an asset for you and you should be, you should, you should always be using your data and, and putting, you know, making it visual and wrapping it in different ways. You definitely don't want to go down the road of duplicate content and kind of using something so much that you're just stretching it thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. Um, but, you know, if you don't have your own data, that's fine too. There's lots of other ways to create, you know, inter great stuff and interesting experiences for people. It doesn't have to be with data. Um, there's public data, though, that you can also source. And it's just, it, honestly, with this, it's, there's no limit to what's possible. It's almost infinite. It's, the limit is just your creativity in coming up with the ideas. And part of that comes out of all the persona modeling and what your, what your audience wants, and what your demographic wants and needs, and what their tasks are. A lot of your content strategy stuff will come out of that because you'll have an intimate understanding of that audience. Great. And we have a question that's coming in from Twitter. Uh, what what defines link quality? Is it is it is it relevancy? Is it page rank? Is uh, and I don't know if we'll get into some of this in the SEO metrics, but yeah, it's a great question. And we we will get in a little bit on the SEO metrics, uh, which we're coming to now. But what defines a quality link is if it is relevant to you and your users, um, if it is relevant to your business. So if a, a a good link to me is one that sends traffic that converts or stays on the site, or returns to the site, or views other pages on the site, a bad link is one that bounces away. A good link isn't necessarily one that sends a ton of traffic, or has high page rank, quote unquote, or Moz rank, or Moz trust, or citation flow, or whatever you know metric you want to put on it. I think those metrics, and I'll, I'll kind of uh, hold off till we get into this next part, but I think it's important to use those metrics in the right way. But ultimately, the bottom line is a link is a good one when it's a really nice, relevant match for your business, and it sends traffic that converts. Great. Um, well, let's take one more question here. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Again, you can follow us on uh, Twitter, at Room Kaufman's handle, hashtag link building, um, or send in questions through GoToMeeting. Um, can you kind of define citation flow? So citation flow is a metric or a concept from Majestic. Majestic SEO is a really powerful uh, backlink analysis tool. And citation flow is basically their sort of um, like Moz Trust. It's, it's kind of a corollary to Moz Trust, if you will, or a page rank. Or it's the, the potential equity flow of a particular link or a particular URL. Um, and it's based on a bunch of, you know, a bunch of hardcore stuff that they've been working on, and it's visualized in a in a cool way. So, great. And I, and I lied. Let's take one last question on this this, this topic because I think it's interesting. And uh, you talked about, you know, if the, 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 it doesn't have to be as frequent, perhaps, as long as the blogging is quote unquote good. Um, can you elaborate on what good is? And also, some people have mentioned that uh, on the on the question panel, I've asked that um, there that they've heard that blogging once a week is a minimum. Uh, are there any minimums like that you should think about to make sure that they're, they're, the, the content is being updated? You know, uh, there's, there may be a, an advantage depending on what your business model is and what your industry is in blogging more often or in having more updated content. If you're in, in, in news and publishing, you're going to care about QDF or query deserves freshness. You're going to care about trends. You're going to uh, it's all about trends and trending topics and stuff like that. So really fresh content is super, super important. And in fact, it's a, it's a necessity. If you're in other categories and in other industries, it's not going to be as essential. And I, I think, you know, to the question of what is good blogging and what is good content, it's completely subjective. But ultimately, what good content is or a good blog post is, is that it satisfies your user's need. You know, it satisfies the need of your demographic or the person or the people you're going after. Um, it's content that grabs people's attention and they share it and they, they link to it and they talk about it and it's useful for them. That's what good content is. I, I think that in this day and age with SEO and with content strategy too, it's less, it's an era of less is more, you know, and we, the old way, the pre Panda days way was you put a ton of content out there um, and you leverage it, and you build a ton of links, and it's all about more, more, more. Put it all in the index, and, and have 
hundreds of thousands are better than 10,000. Today it's about, you know, have fewer pages in there that are more important to you as a business. Um, and that's going to do better in SEO. So there's a corollary there with blogging and with content. It's that it is, it's not a less is more for its own sake just because you should do less. It's just focusing really on making it valuable and um, not taking too many shortcuts because there are so many choices for, for consumers out there of web content and they're going to go somewhere else if they're going to find a better version of what you're trying to do. So. Perfect. Great. Now we can get uh, back into the flow here because the next question is asking about if I'm not, if I'm not focused on, on link specifically, should I even care about the metrics? So let's get right into the, uh, the SEO metrics. Cool. So, okay, not focused on SEO metrics. There we go. Okay, first of all, understanding SEO metrics is certainly important and it's necessary. But I want, I, I want us all to forget about them in a, in a way. And I'll talk about what I mean there. We can talk about PageRank and MozRank and MozTrust and Citation Flow and Anchor Text and everything else. Um, and it's all important to a point and for a specific purpose. PageRank, Toolbar PageRank, is actually can be still useful because when we're using it in SEO, we can look for gray, so-called gray bar pages, pages with no page rank, and it can give us at least an indication of potential crawling and you know equity flow issues on the site. But if any, anyone asks me if page rank is important, I'm going to tell them blank, you know, point blank, no, it's not, and never think about it. The only reason that it's useful is if, if you're you know, an experienced SEO and you know why it's useful, it could be useful. The same goes for Moz rank and Moz trust. And, and SEO Moz is great. We love them. We love their tools. But Moz rank and Moz trust are just numbers that they made up. And it's based on science and it's based on math. And again, they can be useful. And they can be useful as gauges. Uh, relative to themselves, but they are not the end all be all. Same for citation flow. It's it's kind of fingers in the wind stuff that you can use to help you, uh, but it shouldn't be the focus. Anchor text is another one. You know, it's been it's been so manipulated and so spam that Google's had to really dial back how they think about anchor text. And the way that that people link on the web is not with descriptive money terms and exact match anchors. It's with you know click here's and this and that and you know whatever uh, so we need to you know get away from obsessing on that so what sh we should worry about is re really reaching the right audience it's about looking at um, a site's demographic and what their users are like and how closely they match up and are related to ours or the demographic that we're going after so there are ex you know if you're an experienced SEO you know and you look at metrics because you need to know from a link analysis standpoint Stuff like this, the quantity of links pointing to a particular URL, the quantity of unique referring domains, absolutely, the anchor text distribution, very important, and we'll talk more about that later, the amount of links on that page and the internal to external link ratio on the page, how many links are going out, how many are internal to the site, you know, how much equity could flow on that stuff, you know, all that can be useful in ascertaining the kind of the quality or the ability of a URL to flow ranking uh, signals, but it only really needs to be used in particular ways by a very experienced SEO. It shouldn't ever be the focus. So when someone, when, when link building is, when a, when a focus of link building is put on stuff like SEO metrics, like page rank, I want um, links and I want 100 links a month and they should be PR3 or higher, I think it's completely missing the mark on where you need to be focused. The PR3 and higher and stuff doesn't necessarily have any meaning if you can get a link from a PR one or two site or zero site that has an audience that you match up well with and that can send relevant traffic to you. This is the stuff to me that, that I really tell you know our team to focus on that I think that we should all be thinking about is how relevant to my audience is this link? Does this topic match? Is this something my audience would like? And how much traffic does the link send? And what quality is the traffic? And here's, you know, here's where I think as an industry, we all have been so focused on search engine algorithms that we think a link that no one ever sees or no one ever uses is still a good link if it's good for SEO and the search engines crawl it and they pass equity from that. So sort of this like invisible blind link to people is, is valuable because it's useful for SEO. 
that's a very scary thing because links really are about people and Google and other search engines are trying to follow people. They're following the users. So if we focus on people, we focus on the right things. Won't somebody please think of the children? Think of the children. Um, so here's a gut check that I would use. Think about it this way. If a link sends lots of traffic to your site, but that traffic bounces and is low quality and it doesn't convert, that's not a good link. Even if it's doing something quote unquote good for SEO, which you may or may, you know, may not be able to, to exactly tell. But what about a link that sends a small amount of traffic, but that converts really well and it gains the site more returning or new visitors? That is a good link. That's a good quality link. Any questions on that, Ryan? Yeah, I think there's a lot of good questions coming in. Um, so one of the questions is, if, if I have 100 or so writers that are, that are working on uh, uh, building content out, how should I, should I be worried about uh, getting them involved with metrics or? So 100 or so writers, so a big, big workforce pumping out the content. Um, no, I would, I would say it could be even dangerous to apply SEO metrics on what they're doing. But now let me qualify that. There, there may be a case for doing some, some ongoing good SEO training. So really educating them on what you know, SEO is and the sustainable aspect of it. And as you do that training, you can certainly introduce SEO metrics, and they should be aware of those. But I think it would be a little bit dangerous to just throw SEO metrics at a 100-person team that doesn't know anything about SEO, because then they would be focused in on possibly the wrong things. Great, thank you. And um, another great question came in, you know, with the news of the Google Affiliate Network closing, one of the questions is, do affiliates pass uh, link equity? Um, and how, how should we think about that with the Google Affiliate Network closing? So it's always, um, you know, it, it, there's a long story here with affiliate links. And, you know, Google has said that, you know, affiliates can be high quality contributors on the web and so a link from an affiliate is not necessarily a bad link. Google has also gone to affiliate programs that pass kind of SEO link equity through their URLs, through their links, and they've stripped the value of those. So it's not necessarily the case. It, I'd say if you have an affiliate program and you're getting some SEO value out of the links in that program, it may or may not be sustainable based on what Google wants to do. I don't know if the Google Affiliate Network closing is necessarily an indicator of that, although it is an indicator that Google admits that they were sort of part of the problem and that um, they were propelling, you know, maybe potentially bad content through, uh, you know, affiliate sites that are doing whatever they could just to, to make money. And no, no judgment to them because everything is capitalistic online, and as long as it's, you know, legal, uh, it's fair. Um, obviously, we strongly side on the sustainability side and, and we do things that are very low risk for our clients but um, you know affiliate marketing is not spam and if you can get value out of your affiliate links great um, I wouldn't put all your balls in that in that court though great and it's it's interesting that we got through all the way to your fourth uh, the principle on link building before anyone brought up a paid link question and I think it's a good a really good question um, you know, would would anybody or would you or would the engines consider a relevant sponsored post a paid link? And how should, how should you think about that? That's a great question. So a relevant sponsored post. So we're talking about, let's just assume it's high quality, it's relevant to the site, it's targeted to your audience, all that stuff. Um, okay. If it has links in it that are, you know, money term links and exact match anchor text and all that stuff. If it's visibly about SEO, I would, I would say there's every reason to believe that that will certainly work and be fine. And you might be able to do that without a problem. There's also a chance that it could get, you know, either manually and editorially flagged, um, that it could get, get algorithmically flagged. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not going to speculate. Uh, but ultimately, if you're putting, I mean, if it's sponsored and you're putting links in it, then you're, you're basically getting a sponsored link out of it. So um, if you wanted to be really safe, you could no-follow it, um, the links. I, I don't think you'd necessarily have to no-follow them, but that would be the way to, to be super safe on it. If it's um, 
openly, you know, the messaging is, is on there that says, hey, this is a sponsored post and this stuff is paid for and whatever, um, then, and the links are not no followed, then, yeah, it's a little bit of a gray there. I mean, it, it, you know, you're getting links out of something that's paid for. So I would, my advice on that is to take, you know, in those cases, I would probably not go for the links there. I'd go for, uh, for SEO, I mean, so links could be included, but they'd be no followed and take more of a sort of quote unquote natural or organic approach to your link building and building content that attracts links rather than, you know, doing it that way. Long winded answer. I apologize. No, it's great. Thank you. Um, another question. Are you familiar with uh, Matt releases? No. So I, I, as I understand them, they're kind of, um, they're uh, articles, uh, typically consumer community related that, that might be used as kind of, as I understand it, filler uh, in a space and it when uh, paper, for example, needs that. And is there is there value uh, in those? And can you define the value to those? Are they used elsewhere on the web? Are they used on you know multiple places? Is the same content used? I, I believe so. Okay. Yeah. So you know anything that anything is that is not unique to your site ends up being diluted because it gets used on a lot of other sites. And in that case, generally speaking, the strongest site wins. So the site with the most authority uh, is going to kind of take the benefit of that if that content is elsewhere too, generally speaking. Um, there's a potential that if you have too much of that highly diluted kind of duplicated type content on your site, if you have too much of that across the site, that your site could even be penalized for that in an algorithmic way. That Panda could, or you know, Panda classifiers and different algorithmic classifiers could look at your site and say, hey, a large ratio of the content here um, is not unique to you. Therefore, we're going to downgrade your your site. So, great. And you me you mentioned no follow links uh, as a solution. Do they have any SEO indicator at all? So they pass zero value. How is that? How the engines look at it? You know, yeah. It, it, technically, a no follow link is supposed to you know strip all that all uh, equity out. So no anchor text gets passed. No page rank gets passed. When I talk about page rank in this context, it's internal page rank or the equity that flows through that link. Um, and other signals too, you know, whatever those other signals may be that Google cares about. So technically it doesn't even get crawled, you know, it, it's no follow. There, there is speculation that it may still be crawled and stuff, but I, I would just kind of avoid the speculation and just assume that it's just a, a brick wall, that when you put no follow on a link, it's not going to pass anything. Great, thank you. A lot of great questions coming in. And again, uh, feel free to ask them on Twitter or using the question um, box here on GoToMeeting. One last question before we move on to the next section. Um, it kind of goes back to a question that we, we, I think we talked about on a previous webinar, Google authorship. How important is it to tie that together when you're creating content? Really great question, and I'm glad it came up. Authorship is potentially could be huge. So, you know, one of the things that, that authorship does is it gives Google another set of signals or a context. Um, Google understands content, and they understand the linking relationships of that content. With authorship, they also get to understand context. They get to know the person behind it, and then where that person writes, and who that person is connected to, and a lot more kind of valuable intelligence behind it. In time, authorship becomes a source of, for sure, you know, ranking and scoring information, because they can, they, they'll know that based on the author, a piece of content is more or less valuable or more or less relevant to a particular query or a particular space. So it becomes really, really valuable in time. I think they're still working on, I mean, it's going to take time to assimilate enough data for that to be really meaningful in SEO. It's meaningful in SEO as a strategy right now because it's important from getting more visibility in the SERPs and, and getting higher CTR on organic you know, listings. Um, it's important from you know, just a, a, an SEO strategy perspective because you're actually getting you know, brand and face recognition and the SERPs, and you're getting you're getting a lot of benefit that's unseen right now necessarily, unseen in, in how stuff is scored. I don't think authorship right now is necessarily a big scoring um, thing globally. It is a big ranking signal personally. So if you're logged into Google and you search, um, and you're in Google Plus and you're connected to a bunch of people, if there's a relevant match for your query, and it was written by somebody you're connected to in Google+, it's going to be higher up and visible on the page. Um, it's going to be very personalized to you. So it's a huge ranking factor now in terms of how stuff is being personalized. And, and, and thinking about that, two awesome questions just came in off of Twitter, um, the first of which being for, for Google+, um, handles, 
if they're following more negative content or what uh, Google might consider uh, spammy content versus for, versus positive content, and then they 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 link to you to to what you're doing. How does that? Is there an impact there? You know, it sounds like the 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 question is um, almost taking a a corollary from like bad neighborhoods and linking, and and you get a link from a bad neighborhood, and does that hurt you? I don't know, and, and it's, I'm not going to speculate on it, but I would suspect that Google would not hurt you for that because anybody can link to anything, and anybody can, you know, you don't have any control over what somebody else is going to do in that regard. So I think the odds of that hurting you are probably low. I wouldn't say it could never happen, but I think it's probably pretty low. Perfect. And the, se the second part of that question from Twitter uh, also good is, is talking about brands on Google Plus versus individuals on Google Plus. Uh, is, there a, is, is there a difference? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's a lot of confusion about this. So authorship is strictly focused on individual authors and, in, and individuals and tied to Google Plus pages, um, our own pages, our personal pages on Google Plus. Brands are represented also in Google in a way that's similar, and it's called RHEL Publisher. RHEL Publisher is focused solely on brand pages in Google+, and it's a brand page that connects to their home page or any page on their site that they want to that's an authority page on their site. Um, those RHEL Publisher stuff shows up in the knowledge graph. So when you search for something like Think Geek, the, the really cool e-commerce store, um, you'll see on the right-hand side a knowledge graph result come up for them, and that's tying into their Google Plus brand page. So RHEL Publisher and brands can never show as authorship, at least not yet. Maybe that's something that comes. Um, only authors can show as authorship. Authors can also show in the knowledge graph if you're somebody very famous and you're in Wikipedia and Google has sourced that. So Danny Sullivan you know, will obviously show up in the knowledge graph. Um, it's because of the knowledge graph. It's not because of RHEL Publisher and it's not because of, of authorship. Great. Thanks, Adam. I know we have a ton of great questions coming in. Uh, let's move on to how uh, we're going to focus on creating value, and we'll definitely try and come back to these questions at the end of the webinar. Cool. And a lot of this, uh, I'll go quickly here because I think we've covered um, a lot of this. Content, it obviously sits at the center. And when you think about link building, think about how can you build a great experience, not how can you build a whole bunch of links. So content is what it's all about. And whatever that content, quote unquote content is, uh, if it's, you know, it's social because you, you use social media as outreach, as a way to connect, a way to engage, and a way to relate with, with partners, people, audience, etc. It's searchable because that's SEO and it's on page and technical and all the SEO stuff that we need to do. Scalable and, and is what we already talked about. And sincere means making it authentic to the brand and authentic to your voice and authentic to your purpose and very relevant for your users. So let's talk about what that means. Uh, you know, if, if you're the, I'm going I'm to talk about a bunch of different types of content to kind of get the creative juices flowing. And these have all been really successful for the companies behind them because they do things in a creative way, and I think in a way they're, they're going about this in the right way. They're not trying to do link building, but these have been very successful for link building. Uh, New York Times has done an amazing piece called Snowfall. It's a very rich experience. There's tremendous journalism combined with video, combined with interviews, combined with sound. Just a, a fantastic piece. It's, it's the pinnacle to me of online journalism, and it's using it as an interactive medium, and it's really, really terrific. Obviously, that fits well with the New York Times. That's what they do. Zappos has done a great job and gotten a lot of links and a lot of attention and SEO value from their video. They've got hundreds of thousands of short product videos, 45 seconds a minute, and they're incredibly effective. Airbnb is something, you know, a lot of people in the SEO world talk about Airbnb. They're doing some amazing things with content. Their mission district stuff is example. They take neighborhoods in different communities and they have locals there write very definitive, authoritative guides about those neighborhoods. And then they put up this tremendous content. It, beautiful looking, designed very well, SEO'd. It's, it's really great and attracts a lot of attention. A lot of people talk about it because it's so good. And that you know, talking about it and sharing it and linking to it, it's attracting all those links. We talked about um, the 12 Days of Christmas that Online Chew does. It's a great way to attract links as well. Giveaways always are. Infographics are still really great. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk about infographics. Are they good? Are they manipulative? Is Google going to pull away, you know, um, favor from those? And ultimately, 
it's like any other piece of content. If it's not manipulative and it's if it's fit well to your target audience and it's providing value, great. You know, we've had a lot of success with infographics for our clients when they're highly relevant and you know they they uh, earn our clients hundreds of links when we do them. Um, a lot of people don't know this or think about this, I guess, but search actually is content or can be content. If you think about Hipmunk, they have they've gotten millions of links just by doing really innovative, smart search. And they, they make search content because they add in, so if you look at the bottom, they've got data around different filter, different neighborhoods, and they've put filters in to allow you to filter by, you know, I'm with my family, family or a you know, lesbian or gay or a romance or business or whatever it is. It's really great content and really useful, and it's something that people use a lot, talk about, and link to. Uh, the Verge is the publisher to watch these days. They are doing incredible stuff, you know, really great in-depth writing, multimedia, uh, cutting edge, edge HTML5 stuff they're doing. Uh, great, they're gathering tons of links because they're, they're putting together such great content. You can also leverage stuff that you have internally. So for IBM, you know, their thoughts on cloud is really taking the intranet, a bunch of content they had on the intranet and surfacing that and making that, you know, publicly accessible. Leveraging stuff that you already have is, is, is great. It doesn't have to be just data like we talked about. Um, it can also be content like this. Professional video, you know, video is powerful for e-commerce. It's also powerful for basically almost any other niche or any other category. Um, and so for, from everything from, from this site, which is uh, Petrolicious, it's a car site. They do really great videos. They get shared a ton and talked about a ton. We talked about our own um, thought leadership that we do. It gets us a lot of links. And, and you know, not a, I wouldn't say it gets us a lot of links. It gets us links, and we're happy with that. We don't need a lot of links. We just need good links that are relevant and quality. And so it works very well for us, and it's part of using our own thought leadership, our own data um, in a way that's natural. It's an out, kind of an, a very inbound marketing kind of approach. Amazon has probably more reviews than anybody in the world, and not only do they have great reviews, they make them incredibly useful. They have you know, what I think is a very innovative way of showing the star rating. You can hover over it. You can get this. You can go in deeper. You know, Amazon almost becomes a, a content site and is a content site in a lot of ways because of how well they leverage those reviews. You know, kind of an old, old hook is the influencer bait where uh, this is a great example from Eloqua where they, they talk to a whole bunch of people that are influential in social media put together this social media pro book and promoted it and shared it out via social and, and online and it got them tons of links and awareness and was very effective. How are we doing on time? Because we have another section. I don't know. We should probably get to Q&A. Yeah, let's get to a couple questions. I think that's you know, that, last, that last piece you talked about with Eloqua is really interesting because I think that newspaper, a lot of uh, successful smaller newspapers have found that, that if they put more people's story names in, into the articles, People want to buy the paper and read it. The same thing happens online. If you're putting my name in the story, I want to share it. I want to show other people. I kind of want to show off. And so it's a natural share shareability factor there. And you see a lot of that in the SEO industry too. Uh, interview of such and such or, you know, top uh, tips from 10 SEOs and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I think an uh, interesting question came in from Twitter. Um, the question is, should logos be no-followed? Uh, I'm assuming that with uh, universal search, you probably wouldn't want to do that, would you? So logos on another site, is that in the context here? Um, okay, well, let's assume it's, it's asking, hey, if I have a logo that's put on another site, um, should it be no follow? I don't think so necessarily, no. I think it would be situational to see. But if, if it was a sponsorship and you sponsored for that, that little placement on the site and it's on the sidebar or in the footer or something, then you might want to no follow it. But it's not a blanket rule that you should no follow a, a logo on a site. So yeah. we need more there. Got it. Uh, and I think the you know the other uh, topic that I see coming up a lot right now is is, is again the duplicate content issue uh, when you're looking this at this and uh, specifically um, we might have some uh, it seems like there are some sites on on the line that are looking at uh, they work with a lot of third party content where they're required to use some third party content. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on how that should be thought about? So yep, yep, I think it's fine. Um, so don't be too scared about duplicate content. Be scared about the be scared if you only have duplicate content or if you have mostly duplicate content. So it's more about the ratio of, you know, unique stuff that's your own to stuff that's duplicated than it is about just having duplicated content. If, you know, if you look at your site as a whole and say, hey, you know, 60% or 70% of our site is our own stuff, 
you know, 30 to 40 percent we use from other places and we source that content or it's syndicated to us, it may not be a problem and it may be okay. It's about the structure of the page as much as anything, the information architecture, the, the SEO, the technical SEO aspects. Um, and, but if you're in a situation where over 60 percent of your site is based on syndicated or duplicated content, that would be a red flag. So when you're talking about different manufacturer types and they're giving that, that those, uh, uh, a lot of those snippets, for example, are very similar, should you think about going back and rewriting some of your most popular pages or your, or your highest traffic pages in order to get some unique content around that? Or, or how would you? Yeah, I think so. I think it's valuable. Um, yeah, in the e-commerce space, it's very common to just use ma ma you know, manufacturer-supplied copy and all the sites that sell that product use the same copy. It can be a competitive advantage to write your own copy, absolutely. Um, it's valuable. It's worthwhile, for sure, uh, especially if, you know, you're selling the same stuff that Amazon is and so forth. But even more importantly than that is differentiate in, in other ways. And it, this goes beyond SEO, but SEO is almost sort of reflects business, you know, more and more. And so if, you're, if, you, if you write your own ad copy for your manufacturer's white stuff, you differentiate there, so that's good. But if you're not differentiated otherwise in other areas, it's not going to be long until you, you lose market share. And I think that's the, more, the important thing to think about. Uh, um, we'll get one more question, then we'll see if we can move through a few of the analyzing link profiles. Um, uh, one of the questions is about third-party review sites, um, uh, and, and how do they, do they add SEO value, or is it all about, all about how you implement it? Third-party review sites. We're thinking about, like, the, or not just review sites, but uh, review tools like Bizarre Voice, perhaps, for example. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing to use something like a Bizarre Voice or a power, would this be like a Power Reviews power where you're, you're pulling in, uh, you're having somebody else uh, give you the, the platform in order to take reviews and all that stuff. Um, I think each of them probably have an SEO kind of plug-in or add-on or service side to it. I honestly feel that it's best to invest in your own technology here because review content can be pretty valuable. Uh, because you're getting, you know, you're getting user-generated content if if you're getting those reviews, and it's better if you're investing that in your own stuff. I'm not saying not to use Power Reviews or Bizarre Voice. Absolutely, there there's a place for them, obviously, in the market, and and they do well and provide a good service. But um, you know, think about it strategically. If if you can and it makes sense to um, to do it yourself, you know, do it yourself because you're going to you're not going to have to have a contract that expires and you're in, and then you end up losing that content. Um, if there's other stuff that's higher priority and you have to look at the priority list, then absolutely prioritize accordingly. Okay, yeah. do we want to walk yeah. through some of the? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and go real quickly here to the punchline. Um, we have thanks. Okay, so analyzing link profiles is very important. Everything that I said, you know, about uh, SEO metrics are important in a certain context. This is the context where SEO metrics are important. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of analysis now on link profiles. There's a lot of cleanup happening because Google's gotten so effective, basically, at, um, at, at finding manipulative links and, and penalizing sites. Uh, so tools to use, Majestic, uh, Hrefs, and Open Site Explorer. In the interest of time to get to the questions, I'm going to skip through this. Um, this was, okay, here's what you want to look for. So the tool, the best tool to use is, is probably Majestic because they have the most comprehensive link index, and their fresh index is, is preferred. They also have a historic that gives you literally everything that Majestic knows about their, their links. Uh, but if you use the fresh index, it gives you really wide coverage. And the things that you want to look for here is you want to look for stuff like heavy exact match anchor text usage. And Ahrefs is another good tool to look for, and it's easy to spot anchor text patterns in Ahrefs because they have a column um, that shows a percentage of your total links. It shows you a percentage of what are using a specific anchor text. So if you sort by that column, you can easily see what are your highest matches there. But look for that heavy anchor text. That could be a red flag. Um, excessive site-wide links, so maybe you have a million links from one site, or you have 10 million sync, uh, links from, you know, uh, four sites or something like that. That can be a huge red flag. Um, 
if you have lots of links but relatively few domains, that's also a red flag. It's sort of like site-wide, but you know, it might be a case where you just have very few unique domains linking, but you have you know, a small amount of them linking a ton. Another thing to watch for is, is C blocks. Um, if you have many links from the same C blocks, that can be an indication of having links from the same neighborhood, and those can get discounted or be viewed as manipulative. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll define that, yeah, C, block, C blocks. And then if you have a lot of links to deeper pages, that can also be uh, something to look into. So C blocks are, um, if you think about an IP address, it's, it's separated into four octets, A, B, C, and D. A C block is basically the C um, octet. So everything in C, if it, it, it's going to show you a pattern there. And sites a lot of times will have, say, say there's a brand that has 50 sites, and they're, they're all on different IPs, but they're on the same C block. Um, that's considered a unique neighborhood unto itself, and links from that will be discounted accordingly. So look for that as well. Um, okay, and then just really quickly, what do you do if you have some problem? You know, some bad links. Well, first of all, figure out if it's a problem for you. You know, is there risk associated with this? Are you actively being penalized? Are they hurting you now? Um, and then make a decision on if you should do a reconsideration there. Um, in the reconsideration, you'll want to document every, well, first of all, you'll want to start trying to do cleanup. So after, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to go through all of the data to find links that are potentially bad, and of those links, links that you can contact, and then getting contact information for those sites, and then actually reaching out to those sites. It's an incredibly expensive, resource-intensive, um, time-consuming process, uh, but it has to be done diligently, and it has to be done with documentation. Document everything. Um, you'll get a very small percentage will remove the links when you ask. Um, a small percentage will, you know, a large percentage will ignore you. Um, a small percentage will ask for money to remove the link. Um, and all of that should be documented. And then anything you can't get removed, you put, in, put into the disavow tool and um, give that to Google and, and Webmaster Tools. Then file the reconsideration. And the reconsideration sh should be very factual, you know, nothing emotional. Just say, you know, let me go through this because I... Purely factual, you know, nothing about you know, full ownership and accountability and just the facts and everything documented. This is what this site tried to charge me. This, we got success with these links. Everything else is in the disavow. Um, and the, the disavow tool should, should work well. And the reconsideration, you can count on Google, someone at Google actually reviewing that and looking at that. Um, so if you do have bad links and you've, you've ascertained that they are hurting you or potentially are, are going to hurt you, then those are the steps that you want to take. Uh, so, following this stuff should have you uh, up and to the right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, so, we'll um, take a look here at a few extra questions and see if we can, we can answer any additional questions here. Of course, for additional resources, um, you can take a look at rkgblog.com. Uh, if you look at rkg.co slash audet, you'll see a lot of the SEO articles that have been written by Adam. Um, and, of course, you could follow us on, on Twitter as well. And one of the questions here is uh, interesting, a, a Facebook question. Now that we've seen graph search Im implemented, have we seen anyone trying to look at SEO towards optimizing towards graph search on Facebook? Not, you know, not yet that I've seen. Um, I'm sure people are looking into it and doing it. I, I don't know how much graph search is, you know, really out there yet. I think it's, they're slowly rolling it out. I don't know if all of Facebook users have it yet. Uh, but eventually in time it could become something. There's going to be a Facebook graph search side, and, and you can almost count on it having kind of an SEO um, aspect to it. There's also going to be Bing power. Bing is also going to be powering some of the results too. If there's not a, a a direct you know Facebook match to that stuff, so some of it's going to be Bing, which is going to be interesting to watch and see how Bing's share increases uh, both on the paid for paid search clicks and also for organic clicks. Um, and part of it's going to be you know Facebook and um, and based on edge rank and all the stuff that they're that they're doing behind the scenes. So you know, I, have I seen anything? Nope, I haven't seen anything, but. It's something that's going to be interesting to watch. Great, yeah. I think that we've seen, you know, the volumes that we've seen have been pretty small when you're talking about the the, the search that's rolling over to Bing uh, on Facebook. So not a huge area to focus there, but you could have some local businesses that might uh, uh, benefit from that. Um, one of the questions was, are there any um, – uh, 
there's no downside from uh, infographics being circulated and, and additional links. Is there anything you should be concerned about there? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, it, it's good to offer a, you know, an, an embed option or a download option. Um, you can have a link embedded in there. You know, I would be careful to not use a ton of exact match anchor text and make it too obviously SEO spammy. Um, but if, if you're offering a great infographic that's a good resource and, um, and people are sharing that, that's great. It can be great for you, and I don't, I don't think it's something to be uh, too worried about. Great, and we will go through just about, uh, let's go through two more questions here. Um, uh, this webinar is going to be available for recording. You can go to the uh, rimkaufman.com, check out resources. You'll see this webinar along with our additional ones. Plus, if you've registered for this webinar, we'll also send you a link uh, with a video recording. We should have that up in a day or so. Um, one question, uh, someone got notification through Google Webmaster Tool about suspicious links. Should they wait until they get additional notification next time around, or should they actually take action on that immediately? My recommendation would be to dive into the backlink profile, start to take a look, be very active about it, uh, figure it out, see how bad they are, see if you've got some egregious links in there that you want to clean up, and just get a sense for it. But but take an active role in delving into that. Uh, I wouldn't wait. I would do it now. If you find stuff that's alarming in there, you're gonna, you know, need to take the next steps. If you, if you don't, and you say, oh, okay, this doesn't look too concerning, then that can empower, you know, your, your choice and what you do. But I would definitely dive into it. Great. And when we're talking about embed codes, have you heard Matt Cutts say anything about that he thought they were potentially dangerous? Um, so no, uh, I haven't. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe he did in some context. Uh, the you know the thing to think about is, here's an example. If you use Google Insights, that search tool that I showed as just a quick and dirty way to do keyword research um, for volumes, uh, they have embed codes on on a lot of the stuff there. So you can embed you know related terms. You can embed uh, the city and country information. Um, so embed codes aren't bad and aren't evil by themselves. Maybe adding links embedded in there and not giving um, the user an option to remove those links could be um, viewed as manipulative. So, you know, just be as upfront and, and clear about it as you can and, um, and make sure that it's focused on, not just focused on SEO, but focused on what's good for, you know, the user experience there. Great. Well, thanks again, Adam. I think that, um, you know, we've, we're a little bit over our time here. We really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, we will be, as I mentioned, putting this webinar recording up on the website in the next day or so, mailing this out as well. If we didn't get to your question, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. We'll make sure we address those. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending the webinar. Have a great day.